Now in this session, I'm going to discuss with you the clinical management of retained placenta. So first we're going to discuss what is retained placenta, why can it happen and then finally we'll talk about the clinical management. So let's get started and answer the first question. Now we know that the placenta separates and is expelled and delivered in the third stage of labor. The most important factor responsible for placental separation and expulsion and delivery is uterine contractions. Okay. Now, when we follow active management of third stage of labor, the average duration of the third stage is around five minutes. When we follow expectant management, the average duration of third stage is about 15 minutes. So how long can we wait for the placental expulsion and delivery to happen before we call it as retained placenta? So by definition, if it has been more than 30 minutes since delivery of the baby and yet the placenta has not been expelled then we call it as retained placenta plain and simple it is still inside now why is it still inside so have a look here if i say this is the external os here and let's say this is the lower uterine segment this segment here and this is the upper uterine segment and then here you can see that there is a constriction ring. Right? Now this constriction ring can form because of incoordinated uterine contractions during labor. So somehow the baby had managed to deliver. But the constriction ring is there. So maybe the placenta has separated but it's just trapped inside and it has not been able to expel, okay? So, it could be a trapped placenta. The other thing could be that the placenta is still attached. It has not yet separated. Then we call it as placenta adherence. So, trapped placenta means it is separated but trapped. Adherence means that it is still attached. It is not yet separated. And the third thing could be broadly that it is unable to separate because the placenta instead of attaching to the decidua is attached to the myometrium, a condition that we call as morbidly adherent placenta. Now that's different from placenta adherence, okay? So it could be a morbidly adherent placenta, like placenta accreta, it could be increta also, it could be percreta also. There are various types. We discuss this more in detail when we talk about morbidly adherent placenta. But here remember that it could be a placenta that is deeply adherent into the myometry. Okay, then it will fail to separate altogether. Now understand here that in a trapped placenta, clinically the uterus may be contracted. Okay, so when you place a hand on the fundus, you will see that the uterus is contracted. But since the placenta is still inside, the fundal height will be slightly more. Okay, so clinically the uterus will be contracted and the fundus will be higher than expected. Alright, now if it is a placenta adherence that is not separated. Now the question arises, why the placenta did not separate? Well, that can happen if you see the myometrium here, this myometrium here behind the placental attachment fails to contract because it was uterine contractions which are aiding in placental separation. Now I'm saying the uterus is not having adequate contractions. So failure of myometrium behind the placental attachment to adequately contract will result in failure of placenta to separate and therefore retained placenta. All right. And if you have a placenta accreta, a morbidly adherent placenta, it also fails to separate. Now, the situation is problematic 
Why? Because it can lead to severe bleeding. Isn't it? So, if the uterus is not contracting, atonicity is happening, then there can be excessive bleeding at this point in time. Right? If it's a morbidly adherent placenta, if it is totally adherent, it does not separate at all, fine. But if it fails, it separates in bits and pieces. Then from wherever the placental separation took place, but complete placental separation has not taken place. So the uterus doesn't contract fully. So when the placenta separates in bits and pieces, it leads to more bleeding. Remember that. So the key point to note here is that there is risk of excessive bleeding with retained placenta, particularly if there is atonicity, if the uterus fails to contract or if there is a morbidly adherent placenta which is separating in bits and pieces. Let's call it as a partially separated placenta. So you understand that this problem needs to be dealt with in an emergency state. Okay. Now, what are the risk factors? Let's have a look. So, if there is a previous history of retained placenta in a prior pregnancy, for that woman, I'll be more cautious and vigilant uh, in the third stage of labor because there is more likely possibility of recurrence. If there is poor myometrial contractility, that of course is going to lead to retained placenta. Premature contraction of the lower uterine segment can lead to trapped placenta. Like for example, if we use uh, methargin uh, for the active management of third stage of labor when the placenta is still inside, it leads to contractions of the whole uterus, tetanic uterine contractions and then the placenta can get trapped and more likely probability of having a retained placenta. Now, if you compare induced labor and augmented labors versus spontaneous labor. So, when we are using uterotonic drugs, right, to induce or augment labor, then there is more likely probability that when the third stage comes, there may be premature contraction of uh, uh, the lower uterine segment and that can lead to a retained placenta. So, the incidence of retained placenta is more in induced and augmented labors as compared to spontaneous labors. Now, if there is a prior uterine scar, if there is scarring in the uterine myometrium for whatever reason like for example there could have been a previous cesarean section or prior dnc's or there is a, you know previous myomectomy scar then that also leads to more probability of placenta adherence and you know or a, a morbidly adherent placenta and then it increases the risk of having a retained placenta now uterine anomalies structural uterine anomalies particularly those that distort the uterine cavity they can interfere with placental expulsion and lead to increased risk of retained placenta and still birth in the current pregnancy particularly more so if the dead baby has been retained for such a long duration of time that it has become macerated then there is more risk of having a retained placenta and let's also highlight the conditions where there can be poor myometrial contractility right so those conditions are let's say for example women who have preterm labor so it is more likely that we are going to have retained placenta the more the preterm labor is so preterm labor uterine fibroids multiple uterine fibroids they also in, also interfere with the contractility of the uterus like i told you induced labor multiparity these are also identified risk factors because they ultimately are associated with poor myometrial contractility so remember these list of risk factors now moving on let's have a look at the clinical presentation see now there is a 35 year old multiparous woman we have one high risk factor she had a preterm vaginal delivery we had a second high risk factor she delivered at 28 weeks quite preterm at a peripheral center one hour ago so it's been an hour okay she has been referred with failure of placental delivery so wherever she delivered those people they could not deliver the placenta so they referred her she has two prior vaginal deliveries the referral notes mention that active management of third stage of labor was followed obviously so it is routine and the placenta failed to deliver with controlled for traction 
Bleeding started and the woman was immediately referred after starting IV fluids with 20 units of oxytocin infusion on flow. So those people at the peripheral center, they managed the correct way. You see, since she was having bleeding and obviously uh, uterus getting relaxed is one very important risk factor we've just studied. So they started her on IV fluids, oxytocin and with that they referred her. So how do we proceed next? Now, this is a patient with placenta still inside. One hour has gone by. The placenta has not delivered. First of all, let us perform a basic examination, isn't it? So, we're going to go ahead with clinical examination and more so because the bleeding is already there. You see, so we have to focus simultaneously uh, on the resuscitation of the hypovolemic or hemorrhagic shock of the patient also. So resuscitation follows the same guidelines as we have discussed in atonic PPH as well. Now important point is if there is no bleeding, we are not in too much of rush. Okay, we can still wait for some time and how long can we wait? We can wait for 60 minutes from the delivery of the baby from the moment of baby delivery we can wait for 60 minutes more this is the recommendation given by who so we can wait for 16 minutes before attempting manual removal of placenta but this can only be done conservatively if there is no bleeding and in the meanwhile, in those 60 minutes, obviously we want the uterus to contract because it is uterine contractions which will separate and then help expel the placenta so we can give oxytocin infusion IV. Okay, the oxytocin infusion can also be directly given into the umbilical vein. So the umbilical cord is hanging out of the vagina. In the umbilical vein, we can thread in a catheter and we can give the oxytocin infusion directly into the umbilical vein also. That's also fine. Giving IV oxytocin infusion is also fine. Okay, but if there is bleeding, then we have to act immediately. Okay, or if the patient is already under some form of regional anesthesia, like for example, if I am doing a cesarean section, the mother is already under spinal anesthesia, right, and then retained placenta happen, then there is no point in waiting. Okay, the woman is right there, open in front of me, right. Now, let's say for example, if the patient is under epidural analgesia, she is already under analgesia, then there is no need to wait. The only reason why we are waiting is because we want to avoid anesthesia and its complications and a manual removal of placenta. But if she is already bleeding a lot, if the woman is already under some form of renal, regional analgesia, then we attempt manual removal of placenta which we call as MRP. So in our patient let us see what are the findings. Now the patient that was referred to us one hour has already gone by since her delivery of the baby. The woman looks pale pulse rate 110 BP 90 by 60. She's already bled enough. The uterus is not well contracted, bleeding PV++. Now, if this is the profile, obviously you are going to go ahead with manual removal of the placenta. Proceed with that. Now, what is manual removal of placenta? As the name suggests, what are we doing in this procedure? See, one hand we are grasping the fundus, okay, supporting the fundus here per abdominal. And with the other hand, we make a cone of our hand, okay? We can't just go in like this, all right? We make a cone of our hand so that we make a smooth cone and we enter into the vagina and then go up in through the cervix all the way up to where the placenta is. And with this palm, we try to go beneath the placenta here and we try to find the placental separation point, isn't it? So we are poking in between the decidua basalis and the placenta. So we try to find that plane of placental separation. Understand here that if the placenta is not morbidly adherent, if it is not buried and you know attached to the myometrium, 
we should easily find this plane of cleavage and when we do that we just slice our hands up keep slicing keep slicing up like this and eventually end up separating the entire placenta now the placenta will come in my hand I have supported the fundus here per abdominally so that I know that I don't poke in too much and end up perforating the uterus. At the same time, I am making a note whether the uterus is contracted or relaxed and then I pull the placenta out and deliver it. Now you can understand that if I have to do a manipulation like this, intrauterine manipulation like this, I am inside the uterus okay then the uterus needs to be relaxed for this procedure okay so this procedure is an invasive procedure it's an intrauterine manipulation i need the uterus to be relaxed for this procedure so i need to do it in the ot under anesthesia under antibiotic cover and if the need arises then i may take the help of tocolytic agents also to help relax the uterus that's why it's written plus minus may or may not be needed but in ot under anesthesia under appropriate broad spectrum antibiotic cover once i have expelled the placenta and taking it out then my next thing is that the uterus should contract so after the procedure is completed we're going to start the oxytocin infusion to help the uterus contract right so after the procedure note that is complete we have to ensure uterine contraction so start oxytocin infusion okay so while do, do while doing the procedure oxytocin is not ongoing keep that in mind now moving on what is the risk with manual removal of placenta well, as you can see here, I described the procedure to you so you can understand there is risk of introducing infection, there is risk of sepsis, there is risk of injury and bleeding and one very, very important risk is that of uterine rupture. Therefore, we need to be very careful with this procedure. So, as undergraduate students, if there is retained placenta, inform your senior immediately. Because this procedure needs to be done by a senior person. 